Good afternoon. Apparently, I'm ready for my close-up now. My name is Jim Beidler, and uh, I'm happy to be here at the red carpet uh, talking about finding German villages. So, so who's interested in German research? Are you at the right place? Yes, you are. And who's still trying to find the village in Germany? Yes, yeah, yeah. My, my own uh, uh, ancestry is virtually all German, virtually all first wave German. Uh, that is, those coming in uh, colonial times. And uh, as a consequence, I have about 100 immigrant couples in my lineage. So that means a lot of different villages. Thankfully, there are some clusters uh, that, uh, that uh, either I or other uh, genealogists have identified uh, that cuts down on the total number of villages. And I've had some very good experiences in uh, some, some of these villages. Uh, one uh, in the Rhineland area uh, called Sprendlingen is the name of the town. Uh, I had three ancestral uh, 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 couples that, uh, that came from Sprendlingen. Uh, and I, in 2007, I visited there. I was having a delightful outdoor lunch in one of the cafes. And I uh, was telling the lady, you know, Ikaba for Fatern in Diese Stadt. And she says, oh, well, you have to go meet the mayor. So she quickly took me to the Rothaus to meet the Burgermeister. And so I'm, you know, I'm telling him, uh, he spoke, uh, spoke a decent amount of English, so I'm telling him, well, you know, I'm a descendant of the, the Strunk family in this town. And he says, oh, oh, a very prominent family. And uh, I thought, yeah, yeah. And so then, then uh, I say, well, I'm also descended from the Rottmacher family. And he says, oh, a very prominent family. I said, well, I have a third family, also a defendant, descendant of the Mockmer family. And he says, oh, a very large family. <laughs> I didn't ask for any further details after that. So we're going to talk about uh, the how and why uh, that this is important to, uh, to know the, the high mod, because it's not just you know, that you, that you want to know where they came from. It's that to, uh, to get a, access to a lot of the records, uh, you're going to need them because many of them are, are kept on the, the local level. Uh, also, it's not uncommon that you're going to need to de-garble uh, a village name that is handed down to you. Uh, and so, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, talk about records to to search for village names, and then also talk about some of the some of the uh, the top resources. And of course, you know, again, the 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 how and the why. Uh, and most of you probably know Germany was not a unified nation for the first time until 1871, when the Second German Empire was was uh, was founded, and before that was a, a collection of uh, many. Uh, many smaller states. Uh, I, I call this uh, Germany's nonlinear history. It's not like America where, where uh, you know, new counties are formed from former counties, new townships and cities and boroughs struck off of existing townships and counties. Uh, you had dynasties dying out and other dynasties. Uh, you know, one dynasty takes half of the old holdings of a certain state. The other takes the other half. I mean, it, uh, you know, it, as a result, they have relatively few national records uh, compared to our U.S. census, for instance. And as a result, a lot of these records are still kept on the local level. And the archival custody, in other words, which archives you'll find particular records in, may depend on its historical political allegiance to a particular small state rather than the German state that it belongs to today. Yeah, it's complicated. I mean, here's a, here's, here's a map of Germany from 1789 on the eve of the French Revolution, uh, which reduced the, uh, the number of states dramatically uh, because of a gentleman named Napoleon. Uh, I often say, what did, it, what did it, or ask the question, what did it take to solve or to, uh, to uh, uh, make Germany's political history less complicated? Well, no German did it. It took a French emperor to do it. Uh, but before, before Napoleon, uh, there were hundreds. And actually, you go back into the 1600s, there were literally more than a thousand different small states occupying what uh, what later became became Germany and each each 
semi-independent. Uh, you may know the deep history that the, there was an entity called the Holy Roman Empire uh, created by Charlemagne in the year 800. And that existed for a thousand years where, where uh, the, the, the real short course in it is that the, these uh, emperors wanted to rule Italy. And every time they went on an expedition to Italy, they'd give all these small independent states a little more independence. So that they so that they wouldn't be revolting while they were away. So as a result, you have all these small, uh, small d independent duchies and principalities and other other uh, small units. Uh, most of the civil registrations and your your civil registration in Germany that is civil registration of births, marriages, and deaths uh, begins for all of Germany in the 1870s. There are some areas that began it early, uh, especially areas in southwestern Germany. Uh, some began civil reg registration even in the 1790s. Uh, but these are still f found at the local civil registration offices in German. The word is Standesamt, is the name for German civil registration office. Uh, and so before the civil registrations, uh, you're going to be looking at church registers primarily for your vital events. Your, your baptisms are a uh, substitute birth record, your marriages, and then your burials, your church burials are a substitute death record. And even them, uh, in many cases, the originals may still be in a, a village church rather than a, in an archives. It, it varies from area to area in Germany. There are some areas of Germany where, where, they've, uh, where they've microfilmed their church records. Those microfilms are now being uh, converted to digital, ones that the Family History Library did. Uh, ones, many that the Family History Library didn't are being converted to digital by an outfit called Archeon.de for Protestant church records. Uh, the main point is that uh, you can't count on them for all of a region to be all in one archives. Uh, fracturing is unfortunately the, uh, the, the way this goes. Uh, and other records can be in a city archives or a district archives, a state or a regional archives. Uh, and as, as I noted, uh, you know, some researchers have the name of the high mot, that is the home village, the hometown, uh, handed to them. Uh, but it's often a good news, bad news situation because many of those names are garbled down uh, and, and phonetically garbled uh, from what um, they originally were. It's also true that Germany, uh, the black areas are the areas of Germany that the German Empire lost after World War I. And, of course, there were even more areas principally lost to Poland after World War II. So these uh, historically German areas uh, now are, are outside of today's Germany. And really, you've got to, to degarble a place name, a lot of times you've got to learn consonants that interchange phonetically uh, with what we would uh, assume it should be in, in English. Uh, and with vowels, you have umlauts, the two dots that are over an A, an O, a U, and even sometimes a Y, primarily in, in uh, Swiss German. Uh, those, those umlauts create a different vowel so sound that was almost impossible for English, uh, people speaking English to pronounce. And as a result, you get, you get uh, all sorts of crazy names at, uh, at times. Uh, and this is not just the surnames, but also for the, uh, the village names in many cases. So, what type, what type of records should be, we be searching? Well, simply put, you should be looking at e literally every document about the immigrant and his or her family to try to find a village of origin. Uh, and even, even if it's a record that's been passed down to you, like a family Bible uh, or like their, their naturalization paper, uh, even those can be, uh, those village names can be garbled. Those village names you're going to need to probably interrogate, or even if it hasn't been, been uh, garbled, there's a lot of duplicate village names. 
So yes, you you may know it's a town named Ronheim, but it turns out that there are a dozen Ronheims in Germany. Well, which one is it? You may need more information. You may need to find a second recording of that village's name uh, that will give you a geographical locator to figure out, is it Eastern Germany, Western Germany, Southern Germany? Naturalizations, I, I find, are one of the better record groups to, uh, to try to find origins in. Uh, it is generally speaking a two-step process. Uh, So-called first papers that are the declarations of intent. Uh, and I've found more cases where a village name is in those first papers as contrasted to the second or final papers, the actual petitions for naturalization. Because uh, as time in this two-step process, uh, a lot of times they could do the uh, first papers within a year or two of arriving. Uh, the laws changed o over time. Uh, so a lot of information was kind of fresh in the mind, and they may have the ship name, they may have the date of arrival, they may have uh, the port of arrival, as well as then the village and, and state in Germany where they, where they came from. And I have a sample here of a, a gentleman named uh, Peter Mertz. Uh, unfortunately, in his, uh, in, in his uh, naturalization paper, uh, he does not name a village of origin. Uh, but uh, he does call it country Bavaria and his allegiance to the king of Bavaria. And this gave, uh, gave a clue, uh, Bavaria being one of the German, independent German states. And the fact that he left from the port La Havre in France, as opposed to Bremerhaven or Hamburg more northerly, clued me in that he was probably in the area of Bavaria called the Faltz or Palatinate in Western Germany that was politically tied to the Bavaria that we normally think of in Southeastern Germany. But someone from Southeastern Germany would have t gone to Hamburg or would have gone to Bremerhaven rather than La Havre. So that gave, that gave me a clue, a clue there. Um, interestingly enough, he gives his, uh, his arrival in New York on August 24th, 1832. Now, do you think I can find a ship with this guy on and that exact date of arrival? No, that was a dead end. Uh, but uh, also, records to search, baptisms of all the, the children, marriage records sometimes are detailed enough to have villages of origin, church burial registers, sometimes they read almost like obituaries. Uh, for this, uh, this Peter Meritz, uh, I later had... Uh, was able to find his burial record. And in this one, it does mention a village or, of origin of Babelsheim. Uh, turns out it's actually Bebelsheim with an E instead of an A. You know, it was, it was somewhat garbled, but not garbled so much that by working with atlases and working with some of the, the, the tools I'm going to show you that I couldn't, uh, couldn't figure, figure it out. This is the, uh, the detail of that, uh, and again, it shows Babelsheim, Kingdom of Bavaria, which again, it was politically tied to Bavaria, even though he was from a, a separate district of, of Bavaria. And this, I apologize for the fuzzy of this. It, lo it looks better on my computer, I swear to you. Uh, but this, uh, this is from a, a Catholic baptismal record, uh, and it shows that the father was born... Uh, according to this, uh, a, um, uh, a town named Bartenbach, uh, it turns out it's a, uh, uh, a Berting, Bertingbach rather than back. But this, this was a baptism uh, of a child of the immigrant. There were 10 children of the immigrant, a good Catholic family. Uh, and only this one did they fill in where the father was from. And it was not the baptism of the direct line of the child in the direct line of my client. So this is why we do uh, more whole family genealogy, not just direct line, do collateral lines because sometimes those records will have a village of origin that's not in the direct uh, record of your direct line. 
Also, tombstones and obituaries, especially in German language newspapers. Yes, I have a new book on newspapers. So this is something that, that I've investigated a lot. Uh, and you know, there, there are plenty of instances where someone may have an obituary in an English language newspaper and also a, um, a German language newspaper. And the German language newspaper is going to have more detail uh, and, and probably less garbling of the, uh, the village name if it's listed. And yes, uh, sometimes we have uh, uh, right on the tombstone, we have uh, the name of the village listed. Uh, in this case, Reutlingen in uh, Württemberg. Uh, also, uh, military records, uh, enlistment papers, discharge papers, pension documents can be good. Uh, U.S. Census rarely is so granular that it gives town birth names. Usually it's just Germany or Prussia. Uh, not, so, not, so, not real helpful when it's that. Uh, another oddball thing, but in some, some German areas, fraternal societies records, German-American friendship societies. Uh, a lot of times when, when those, and th those were usually all male organizations, when the men were initiated uh, as part of their initiation, there'd be a full membership record given uh, with uh, including their village of origin. And uh, letters from relatives and postmarks on letters. I had, had a, a correspondent write to me once uh, that uh, he was able to solve, find the village of origin from the postmark on a letter that had been received from the old country. Uh, literally every scrap of data that you can, uh, can try to find might have something. Okay, now let's get into uh, to some resources. Myers Wartz, Myers Gazetteer, has been on Ancestry.com as a free item for, uh, for some time, but everything's gotten a whole lot better uh, with an online version, which I'm going to talk about next. Wendy Unkefer has a uh, booklet called uh, the late Wendy Unkefer booklet called How to Read and Understand Myers Orts. That can be helpful. And a book that is in German, if you're going to really get into the weeds on this, is Gerhard Kübler's Historisches Lexikon der Deutschen Länder, which goes over all those little little states back into the Middle Ages and what their political affiliations are. You know, if you're if you're if you've gotten somebody deep into Germany, well, what you know, what little duchy or what little principality was it a part of? That's a book to to uh, to try to borrow. And then finally, Ravenstein's Atlas. This was a very detailed atlas of the Second German Empire from the 1880s. And like Myers Orts, we've been kind of revolutionized in the uh, uh, last year since it's gone live on a free site called MyersGaz.org. Uh, and this takes the, the information from both Myers Gazetteer and Ravenstein's map and puts them together in a, uh, a searchable database. And I want to go through a step-by-step -step on this. It has a very um, plain-looking interface. Uh, and uh, My Myers Gaz, you put a, a village name in the, in the search box. And uh, I, I chose a very common name called Hochheim, a uh, good German name. Uh, and it br brought back uh, uh, quite a few results. Uh, so I chose the very first one, Hochheim, Hochheim in the area of Main. And then what comes up in Myers Gaz, uh, it gives you all the, uh, the information that's in the original printed version of Myers Gazetteer. It also in, and th this is a, a blow up of, uh, of all the, the things. And as you see, it's quite abbreviated. That's why Wendy Unkefer's How to Read Myers Gaz is a good booklet to, uh, to have on your bookshelf. But a lot of the key ones are key things are abstracted here and below the circle, uh, where where it gives what the, where that Standesamt, the civil registration office is, where the military registration office was, and so forth. But then probably the the absolute neatest thing of it is the the map that they have it targeted. They uh, they put it put it to GPS. Uh, to uh, to show you where Hocom uh, uh, mine is, and if we uh, click on that map, it brings us to uh, a, a uh, detail of the modern day map surrounded by the villages. 
But it gets even better than that because you go to this toggle here and the toggle, one of the options will give you that Ravenstein's Atlas from the 1880s. And, and it's remarkable how many villages have gone in and out of existence, uh, how many ones have merged into others. So this, give, this toggle uh, gives you both the modern and the 1883. And I sound like I'm an infomercial, but there's more. Uh, because if you toggle, go to that toggle again uh, and blow it up, uh, you can get the, the jurisdictions, you, the standesamps, the Catholic parishes, the Protestant parishes, and even the Jewish synagogues. And I chose the Protestant parishes and churches. And there, either on the modern map or on the historical map, uh, you can find it here. They don't show up too well in green are where the Protestant parishes are. There's one right in Hochheim, but it gives you the ones that are closest around that. Because uh, if, if your, your ancestors are like mine, you're not all going to find even the same family all in one village. Uh, there, there are going to be times when there are oddball records that are found in some of the other, some of the other villages. So, you know, resources like this are going to help you put it in context uh, and hopefully find the civil and church records in those adjoining villages. Uh, also, I should note that Myers Gaz is constantly improving the people who are in charge of it. Uh, they recently added uh, uh, a phonetic search. Previously, you had to you had had to have an exact spelling. Now, now it uses the double metaphone uh, phonetic German phonetics uh, to uh, to adjust for uh, these garblings that uh, that we find. Uh, and then some other some other resources. You might want to have a, a good German road atlas and I list the name of that. And for both uh, first names, surnames, and village names. Uh, the late Ken Smith's uh, German Names, A Practical Guide, is another thing to put on your, your bookshelf. And Ernie Toady, uh, his monograph, uh, inter Interpreting Misspelled Germanic Place Names, is another good, good resource for you. And then, then finally, I want to just point out there are uh, some uh, other gazetteers that can help you with the World War I and the World War II losses of territory where they translate the German names into then the French name, like in the case of Alsace-Lorraine, or the Polish name. Uh, and this, uh, the, for the World War I losses, it's this Deutsche Fremdsprachisches Ortsnamen für Verzeignutz. And, uh, you know, goes into all those different places. For the World War II losses, just about all of the World War II losses of Germany were to Poland. Uh, and there's two different, two different uh, uh, potential gazetteers uh, that you, you might, be, uh, might be looking at. Thanks for joining us here for our Rolling Out the Red Carpet YouTube series. Be sure to click that red subscribe button here on our YouTube channel and you'll get notifications of all the new upcoming videos.